So this cooperative learning explains why like nodes, that is similar nodes, and the SOM tend to be grouped together at the end of the process. So you'll see here we got some greens grouped together, oranges, reds, and then some dark colors to the right. Cooperative learning decreases with each epoch, that is to say the neighborhood radius decreases uh, until it finally stops. Uh, at that point, uh, the training or the learning rather becomes competitive, uh, and and it stays competitive through the end of the final epoch until it's all done. And so, what that means, uh, what competitive learning is, is that when a neuron wins, when it beca uh, becomes a winner because it represents looks most like the incoming data point, it adjusts itself toward that data point, but it does not adjust its neighbors anymore. Sometimes the data will not look like this uh, with, uh, where the colors cluster together like above. No, it, it'll look like this. When the data is highly dispersed, uh, and that is to say there is no grouping or clustering among the data, you're going to find that the SOM will not organize well. So that uh, leads us to then classification. When all the epochs have completed, Every data point has some neuron which is closest to it or is associated with it. Uh, some neurons may not have data points associated with them. They did not learn well. Neurons which have data points associated with are said to classify the data. So neurons that end up with, with at the end of the process with a, a color, uh, then uh, that means they have data points. Those did uh, classify successfully. And that brings us to, brings us to clustering. Uh, sometimes the data points naturally cluster when cross-plotted. And that's easy to see when you're talking about two-dimensional or three-dimensional data. But uh, when we go beyond three dimensions, it's not then easy to visualize clustering. Uh, for instance, it, we mentioned that in two-dimensional data, we have two attributes. So and we can represent three-dimensional data with three attributes. Uh, but what happens when you have 25 attributes? That you, you really couldn't see the clustering there. But when there is clustering, what, do, what does that indicate? Well, it shows that, that there are similar signal responses in the seismic data. In our case, those are similar colors. And then we have some outlying data that is not in the cluster. What, well, what does that mean to us? Well, this would be anomalous responses where the seismic data at that point doesn't look like anything else. And uh, you will find that not all data clusters naturally. And so then what does that tell us, what does also tell us? And that basically the same as when a cross plot does not cross plot, uh, and that, the, that means that those attributes did not correlate well. Once again, not easy to visualize when you're talking about 25 dimensions. So the number of attributes can be extended to any dimension. We have tested up to 50 seismic attributes. As you can imagine, we would not be able to uh, display that. We'd not be able to visualize that. So if you're wondering why I had to use colors to illustrate that, try to imagine me illustrating 50 dimension of data. Uh, so it's not easy to visualize beyond three attributes. So let's extend the concept of three attributes and animate uh, that, the learning process. I'm going to present now a cube where I'm introducing a new axis along uh, for the blue colors. So my Z axis will represent my blue colors. I'm interested in another seismic attribute. If I had, uh, if I had um, coherency and, and uh, amplitudes before, this may be an entirely different attribute like Hilbert, right? So now I'm going to cross-correlate three, three um, uh, attributes represented as colors. I'm going to do so with a program that we developed for demonstration purposes. Here is a cube, and you can see the data is clustered and from magenta color, some white color, some green colors, and there's some dark colors in that top right corner over there that are very difficult to see because they're, they're dark colors. But you'll also notice as I rotate around that there are some data points, and by the way, the triangles are the data points, there are some data points that do not cluster. So they, aren't, they don't belong to any particular group. You know, those, these are these cyan ones, these darker blue ones. There's also some red ones uh, along the back wall there. You've got a little cluster of white ones over here next to the bigger cluster of white ones, but they don't really belong to that cluster. 
uh, easily visualized in 3D. If this was 25D, uh, then I would, wouldn't be able to present this. But yet I would expect my neurons to find the, how the data is organized. So uh, over here in the top right, you see a little square. That represents the starting point for the neurons. I'm going to start out by stepping the neurons through. I'm presenting, as this is, you'll see this, how the neurons start moving toward the colors, They're moving through that darker cluster right now, so they don't show up well. <clears throat> but uh, as I, every time I click this step button, I'm presenting a data point. So some neuron is the winner, and some neuron is, dra is pulling along its neighbors. And that's, if you notice the sum over on the right, that's beginning to show up as they move toward the red colors now, this, the red data points. Uh, then over here in the sum, you see the neighborhood effect. One of, those, one of those neurons, perhaps it was number 39 here, is closest to the red, and so it moved closer to the red and it starts pulling uh, all its neighbors with it. Let me step through there a little bit more. And now we're showing that some neurons uh, that were uh, as I'm presenting the blue, there were some neurons that were closest to the blue, and some were closer to the green. So those are giving up and trying to move toward the red. They're going to move toward blue and adjust the neighbors toward blue, and some of the greens are moving toward green, and they're adjusting their neighbors toward the green. And you can watch as those colors, as the neurons move toward the various um, data inputs and adjust themselves and, their, and adjust their colors. Once again, easy to visualize in 3D. I would say impossible to visualize in 50D. Okay, so now, uh, instead of stepping through, I'm going to just let it go automatically. And it, should, it may go pretty quickly, so you might want to keep an eye on the Q band and one eye on the, uh, on the SOM, but here we go. And you'll see that they're basically going to go through there. They're going from cluster to cluster as data is input to it. Uh, and now it just went, just kind of like finished the process very quickly. And what's, what happened now is that um, uh, I have numbered the neurons where they ended up. Okay, so those little numbers you see there next to the rectangle, that's the, uh, and that's the number of the neuron. It's this ID, if you will, as mapped over on the SOM. So over here on the, on the right-hand corner, we've got self-organizing map. And you'll see now how the data has uh, organized itself on the map. You've got the lighter pastel color colors over here. You've got some greens, some darker shades on the top. You've got some magentas going here. Uh, and uh, we also have this one, number 40 here, with a square in it. Uh, it did not end up with any data points associated with it. If you were to have a lot of these little um, uh, neurons with X's on them that uh, didn't have data, then you probably want to adjust your learning controls for this particular type of data. Uh, now I'm going to show you, uh, well this indicates uh, then our classification as we mentioned before, all of the colors in the cube now represented in within uh, somewhere among these 49 um, nodes. Okay, so uh, basically all of these data points are represented 49 different ways. Actually, 48, because one of these nodes, one of these nodes did not find any data. But how can I tell which data points go with what node? Well, I can connect the associated data points back to the neurons by doing this. Now, this demonstrates the clustering within the data in, in 3D. Okay, so uh, basically neuron number 27 has picked up the blue colors that were outliers. So it did find the outlying data, data that does not look like anything else. And back in the back corner there, we got number 42. It picked up the red. You can see the, you can see the over on the SOM on the right-hand side here, the red 42. It centered itself around some outlying red colors out there. And then we've got some data here in the white where a lot of, color, a lot of the neurons gravitated toward the white and we've got a situation in, with number 20 where one neuron just has a lot of data associated with it. So this is how it's clustered. So basically the, that one neuron number 20 seems to have a lot of data associated with it. And over in the cluster uh, along the white area, there's a lot of variations of white. And a lot of neurons just kind of went there and co to cover the various variations. Imagine trying to do that in many dimensions, but yet that's what the neurons do. So I have demonstrated here classification and clustering. And how you apply this to your application, well, that's beyond the scope of this webinar, but we can pick that up in a, su in a subsequent webinar. So 
So I hope what I've demonstrated in a non-technical way, just kind of by way of demonstration, how a cajon and self-organizing map can help us classify data, classify it through these neurons and these uh, nodes, and they can help us identify clusters, whether they're outlying or, or clusters, a lot of uh, small variations in it, and it can do so for any dimension of data, dimensions way beyond anything that you could um, visualize. And now the exact meaning of those clusters, of those outliers, well, they're left for the interpretation because this is a very generic technique. It can be it doesn't have to be used, say, in seismic attribute analysis, right? It can be used basically across any industry. Same technique, so that what it would mean uh, is subject to interpretation for that application for that particular set of data. And now this this tool then can be used. Uh, among other more conventional seismic interpretation processes, it has the advantage or the benefits uh, of reducing human bias in the analysis. So, for example, if you're looking at numerous different seismic attributes, uh, if you had to look at 25 different seismic attributes and you'd start to wonder what the relationships are among the various um, attributes, this will help you classify and organize that. These are the references that I was referring to. Uh, if you want more information, more detailed information uh, regarding, for instance, the mathematics behind all this, uh, I would refer you to these resources. And I would like to thank the authors of these, those resources as I have used. And this concludes our webinar. I thank you for your time uh, for uh, visiting with us. Please feel free to share any comments with me and uh, stand by for future uh, webinars or we take this concept further. Once again, thank you very much.